That was really cool. Look, did you see the camera pan? That was excellent. All right, my name is Destin Sandlin. I have a YouTube show called Smarter Every Day, and I have been asked to come out to the Huntsville Ham Fest today. So that's where I'm at. We are at um, the Gigaparts booth at the Huntsville Ham Fest. Uh, again, Destin Sandlin, WS4RKT in the ham world. And I'm here with a genius, Tim Cunningham. Right? You're a genius? I, I could be. He's literally a cunning ham. We, we, we had that discussion, right? I was born a ham, yes. Yeah, you're going to have to hold that mic up, I think, so they can All hear right. you. So um, so I, I have a, a couple questions. I, I grew up as a uh, as a fan of ham radio. My dad is here. He's he's right there, KD4 and NY. So how's it going, Dad? So they're a little behind on the, the cameras. They'll, they'll switch over to you in a minute. But... Um, so we used to go to ham radio festivals all the time. We went to Dayton. We went to – there you are. You can wave now. Yeah, we went to uh, the Dayton Ham Fest. We used to come to the Huntsville Ham Fest all the time. And it was more of a, as an observer. I didn't know a lot about what was going on. But in the early days of APRS, my dad started trying to link up a GPS to his ham radio and tried to get that information up into the internet so that we could track our position anywhere in the world. And my understanding, Mr. Cunningham, is that you are the expert at this particular topic. Is that correct? Depends on what kind of questions you ask. I'm going to need you to own it. <laughs> you need to be the expert today. That's what All I right. need. I need the expert. So today you're the expert. Okay, so, right. so APRS. Let's start with the basics. What is APRS? APRS is the uh, automatic... Uh, packet reporting system and it is a tactical communication system and part of that is it allows us to track objects if, it, if, if you want to track a car if you have teenagers you want to know where they went to for the night you can actually put a tracker in their car it'll send out a position report over the radio waves which will get back to the internet and so you can actually watch the movement of the car or some object on the internet as it moves along okay so I've been, I've been trying to do this recently. So I've got, uh, I've got something pulled up here. So there is a website called APRS.FI. If you can zoom in there, it's Ken, right? Ken, if you'll zoom in. So APRS.FI. This is what you know. This is the website that people have pointed me to. Is yes. that in Finland? Am I getting that yes, correct? Yes, that is a Finnish website. So it's a person in Finland that owns this website. They're taking the information, slurping it off the internet sticking it back up over a Google Maps overlay so I can track your teenage daughter. That is right? correct, yes. <laughs> okay. that, that all goes over the Internet, and, uh, and you can see all the stations that are reporting. Some of the stations that you see on that map may or may not be uh, you know, on the ham amateur radio uh, band where they transmit. They may actually be connected to uh, an Internet link, which will also do the same thing. So if you don't have a radio, you can also use the Internet to put your information out on the network. And any one of those objects that you see on there, they all have graphical symbols. These, those all represent something. So if you see WX, it's for a weather station. Those are stations that have their weather stations connected to their radio. So that's also tra transmitted back to the APRS backbone. That information is picked up by Find You. It's sent out to Mezzo West. So you know the weather folks who look at this stuff get that information from those those remote uh, weather stations that are out there. Okay, so you said something I, I, I'm not familiar with. You said Mezzo West. Mezzo West. That that goes to the NOAA and the weather reporting side of it. So that's disconnected from the radio, but they actually take that information and decipher it. Okay, so uh, full disclosure here: the reason I'm interested in APRS is I'm, I'm taking pilot lessons. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is I want to be able to fly in the airplane and I want to just look at the pattern that I'm running so that I can, for example, if, I want, if I'm flying straight ahead, I want to make a left-hand turn, a 30-degree angle of bank, and I want to see if I can perfectly make a circular arc in an airplane, yes. get back to one location, and then perfectly make a right-hand arc. Because when you're at 5,000 feet, you can't tell where you're at, you know, 20 or 30 feet. So that's my goal for APRS. Do you, do you think it's a pretty good application for that? Yeah, you could, you could certainly use it for that. If you have a tracker inside the airplane that's transmitting that information, then you could actually get, like, when that goes out, it's going to get picked up on the internet. So as you make that turn, depending on how often that you transmit, will determine how, how much resolution you have in that turn. You can also program some of these trackers. I know you have one up here. Uh, so that if you make a 30 degree turn or a 40 degree turn, it automatically transmits a position so that you have that resolution as you make that turn. 
So, yeah, we had a guy here just recently. We had a two-meter uh, activity that went on where they were transmitting uh, information about zip codes throughout North Alabama from Huntsville to Gadsden. And one of the guys went up in an airplane. And if you take a look at the map, you can actually see the track that, that he takes and all the circles he made around Huntsville. He went up to uh, Gadsden and made some circles. He went over the Harvest Monrovia area and made some circles. And you see everywhere that he went, and they were really nice circles. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not quite there yet. So I, I, I guess I, I misunderstood the point. What's he trying to do? He's trying to go over as many zip codes as he can? Yes. Uh, a lot of the other stations that were on, we had a couple up on Monte Sano. It's okay. a higher point. And they were trying to collect as many different zip code areas because they got points for everyone that they made contact with. But being in the airplane, you, you have a greater coverage because you're up higher, so you have more distance. But if you're flying to all these different cities, you're picking up stations none of the other guys are ever going to have. So it's really an unfair advantage for somebody being in the aircraft to do that because they had the opportunity to move to different places where all the radio stations were. Okay, so here at the base level, I, I flew on, what is today? I think I flew on Thursday night. Uh -huh. So I'm trying to pull up the data from my Thursday night flight. Can, sure. you, can you help me do that? Yeah, so over here uh, on the right-hand side, if you put in the call sign of the station. WS4RKT, mm -hmm. okay. Search. Yep, search, and it'll find that. There it is. And then if you go um, over here, there should be uh, show the last number of days. If you want, so if you want to go back to Thursday, today's Saturday. I'm just going to uh, say the last seven days. Seven days. And then if you want to see a, a tell, there's a track for uh, the tell length. You can specify how many days you want to do that. So for all the positions you reported, it, it'll show a line connected to show you where you're at. So right right here. So yes. so Is I was. Prior field? Yeah, that's prior field indicator. That's the Decatur Airport. Wow. So, okay, so I've got some problems here. So I think you, you automatically know what I've done wrong here. But um, it's clear to me, I, I'm an engineer. It's clear to me that I'm either a really, really bad pilot that has the ability to do infinite radial acceleration, sharp turns. sharp turns in my radar <laughs> airplane, or I am not, uh, I don't have a, a quick enough sample rate. Yeah, that's exactly Which of right. the two do you think it is? Probably the sample rate. <laughs> okay. There's, there's two things that come into mind here. One, if, if you're transmitting every minute, you're only going to see a minute of resolution. So every time it actually puts a point out there, it's just a point that draws a line to another point. Okay. So now some of these trackers... If you specify the angle of the turn, it can also send out a position. So if you turn 20 degrees or 90 degrees, it's going to put a position out. So depending on how often you transmit that location will determine how smooth those turns are made on your map. Got it. So so what you're saying is, okay, so this is this is my tracker. I bought this, uh, I bought this off of a website called Bionics. Yep. It's called a, uh, an all-in-one tracker, I think, yep. if I'm not mistaken. And so... At its heart, what APRS is, as I understand it, this is a question. This is not a statement. So the question is, I've got a power source. Yes. I've got a GPS antenna. Yes. And I've got a radio, right? Is yes. that the radio there? That's the radio. Okay, that's the radio. So what I do is, for this particular one, I just turn it on and I try to acquire a GPS signal. I'm not going to do it because we're inside this metal building. But this is, at the heart what an APRS radio system is, correct? Yep, that's what we call an APRS tracker. It sends out uh, positional information. Okay, so so my question is, how can I do this in a more robust way? Because what I'm doing right now is, I'm gonna turn this off because it's just gonna waste battery. So what I'm doing right now is I'm getting in the airplane and I am clipping this tracker to the top of the airplane. And I've got this omnidirectional antenna that's kind of bolt, you know, folded over like that. And one thing I did notice about my data is that, um, I don't know if I can see this, but yeah, right here. So when we when we take off from the airport, you know, I took off on 3-6 going north. When I took off from the airport, my first hit was, you know, several miles away from the airport. Right. And that's because I'm assuming it's because I got elevation and I got better line of sight to the to the station, correct? Right. Okay, would you talk a little bit about that? How can I, how can I fix that? Okay, that, that could be a better antenna on the outside of the aircraft. Uh, if you have an, an antenna that's sitting inside the aircraft, you may not be getting enough signal out into the radio world so that somebody can hear you. So, yeah, well, is it because, okay, so an aircraft is a, you know, a, an aluminum frame. So do I have a Faraday shield going on there? Is that, Basically, is that, uh, you, you, you're containing all your RF inside the aircraft unless you have a window that it squirts out. Okay. So, you know, the best, the best.
place to have an antenna is on the outside of the aircraft. Okay. That would certainly help. Don't you love these simple questions? Yeah. Or, or, or you can have, you know, like they do on the International Space Station or the, uh, the space shuttle. They used to have this little antenna they put in the window. It was a okay. little circular antenna, and they just put it in the window, and that was their their antenna to go to the outside world until they finally got antennas mounted on the outside of the spacecraft. Okay, so time out on APRS. <laughs> We're going to space. So... So you have actually communicated. That, that's the cool thing about ham radio. We're talking about VHF, UHF frequencies here, right? Yes. Now, what is the frequency of APRS? It's on 144.39 megahertz within uh, North America in the U.S. Okay, so every every continent or every, you know, not necessarily every continent, but every large landmass or geopolitical entity has a particular frequency that APRS operates yeah, it, on, right? It may vary throughout different countries depending on what frequencies they have mm -hmm. allocated to use in that in that country. Okay, so so this only squawks at one frequency, okay? But what about yours over there? Now, uh, this is your system, right? Yep, this is uh, my system. This is... Uh, I, I did say we're going to space. We are yep. going to space. I just, I'm trying to get there slowly. And I've used this to talk to space. You've used your handy talkie yes. to talk to space. I've actually used this handy talkie to go through a satellite into space, retrans my, my, my signal, and bring it back down to Earth to talk to somebody, say, in California from Alabama. I choose not to believe you. <laughs> <laughs> You've really done that. I've really done that. Okay, so how did you get to the satellite from your handy talkie? Uh, on this particular handy talkie, it was, I can't uh, even get. I can't even get to my house from inside of an airplane, <laughs> Boy, and you're using this to get to space? you got to keep in mind that uh, VHF is line of sight. So whatever you can see is where you're going to get to. So if right. I can see that spacecraft, even though I can't visibly see it, but it's line of sight and there's no tree or building in between me, my signal is probably going to get there. So what you're doing is you're using your whip antenna here right. to hit a repeater. The repeater's going, are you going through the Internet or are you going straight? In, this, in this case, through the satellite I was working was directly to the satellite. The satellite heard my signal, and basically reflected that signal, just like a repeater. Okay. Yeah. So when did you do this? Uh, this has been about uh, probably about 10 years ago. It was, uh, I think it was AO14. It was a satellite that was used in the uh, healthcare industry for taking information around the world for doctors and stuff in remote locations like South Africa. And when that mission was over, they rededicated the satellite to be like a repeater. So you could go up on one channel, and if it heard you, it basically repeated that signal back down on another channel on another band. So it's just like a repeater that you have here locally on the mountaintop, except for this repeater is way out in space, and it has a lot more coverage than what you what, can expect. What what altitude was it at, do you know? That's uh, That was a LEO uh, satellite, Lower orbit. so it, it might be up around four to 800 miles. Did, did you go straight to the satellite and then to the space station, or did you go to the satellite, then to like Tedris or something like no, that? No, in that one it was directly into the satellite, receiver once it heard me it just retransmitted my signal down on another frequency so as soon as i was talking somebody heard me and they came back to my call i made the contact and i was happy did did they send you a postcard from space uh no not from space who is the astronaut that heard you oh now that was a different story that's on the uh when they had the sarex oh Shuttle you're saying you just radio. worked the satellite yeah i went through a satellite okay nobody on it i'm excited i'm sorry yeah, yeah okay uh, it's just floating around in space <laughs> okay Got it. So you worked the satellite, and then you talked to somebody in California. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Did you get a Did you get a, a contact out of that? I, I did get a card from that. Fantastic. Card. That's yes. pretty good. That's fantastic. So that's a, when you when you do that, you officially make the contact. You swap postcards, and then you what do you do with your cards? Yes, yeah, that is that's called a QSL card, a confirmation of that con, that radio contact to say I did work you on this date and this time. If you send that card, and the other station sends a card back, then you've got a confirmation that it indeed happened. It, okay. So, you've worked space. Now, have you worked to space? You said you have contacted an astronaut. Yeah, I've uh, worked several astronauts uh, on the on the uh, shuttle program. It was called SARX, Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment. Uh, actually, Ron Priest, who's no longer with us, uh, WA4SIR. I worked him on two different missions. Uh, I met him in between missions, so the second mission, he knew who I was when I called, so it was pretty cool. No way. Yeah, and he was coming down over the Mississippi River, going over the Gulf Coast, and just explaining what he's seen, looking out the window as we made the contact. Did you have to Did you have to time it? Did you know where he was in the orbit? Yes, you, you, you have to know where he's at, because obviously, with the whether it's the shuttle or the space station, it's constantly moving in orbit. Once it goes over, one of the things you know about it is every 90 minutes, it's going to come back. 
right. if it's going to come overhead. Right. And so the opportunity to work that again when it comes back is 90 minutes later. Then you have about a 10 to 12 minute window thereabouts when it comes into range, what we call line of sight, acquisition of signal as it comes above the horizon before it goes over the opposite horizon. So your, your time to communicate with them if they go around the earth every 90 minutes is about a 10 to 12 minute slice before you, you lose them with radio contact. So w when you did that, he knew that you were contacting him, and what did you talk about? Well, it was very quick because there's about a thousand other people trying to make the same contact. It was on, on an amateur radio band, and everybody's trying to make that, that once-in-a-lifetime contact with an astronaut. But I had a steerable array, so my antennas were actually tracking the... Cheater. <laughs> Azimuth Elevation Rotor would, in a program that actually controls that hardware to move those antennas across to track it as it goes through space. So I have a maximum signal all the time put on the space station so or the or the shuttle at the time. So you basically were operating a flamethrower and everybody else had a cigarette lighter and you were just you yes. were just overwhelming them. Yeah. In, in all seriousness, that's what you did. Not your, only just power. Your signal to noise ratio was much higher than everybody else Absolutely. and you just blew them out of the water. Signal to noise. Because you're awesome. Yes. You're, the, you're a geek of geeks. That's pretty fantastic. All right. So one thing I wanted to uh, ask you about, if, if my internet will allow me, hang tight before you look over my shoulder there, Ken, because I'm having to pull it up through my email. Um, I want to talk about the APRS settings because, you know, we, we talked about the update rates. I'm not getting a, there it is. We talked about the update rates on my, uh, on my system here. Now I have heard of a setting where you can increase your output rate of data points if you're in a, a, uh, an increased acceleration. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. so if I'm traveling straight and level, then I'll, I'll update every two minutes or something like that. But if I create a, a turn or something like that, I'll have smart transmissions. Yeah, it's called smart beaconing. Smart beaconing. Can you please talk about smart, smart beaconing? Uh, this is something I, yeah, I don't know about. And I haven't smart had beaconing it. is, uh, it could be based on speed or you go, Ken, if right you here. change direction. Uh, obviously, if you're going down the street and you're headed north and you turn to the west, and you want to make sure somebody knows you're headed west at that time, it says, okay, you've made more than a 45 degree angle, send a signal out over the radio network so they know that you made this turn and you are now heading west. Okay, so help me understand this. I've got, I've got something here called minimum turn angle. So how does that work? If I have, obviously that means that the APRS system has some sort of gyro in it. Is that, is that the case? Yes, the, the GPS knows where you're at, which direction you're headed. So if you turn more than 25 degrees, it should send a signal out. So you have a real-time vector being calculated, and if that vector changes directions by X number of degrees, then it will then send out another ping. Is that, that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, so, so that's called minimum turn angle. What about turn slope? Is that some kind of a INS, inertial navigation system inside? That, that term I'm not familiar with. Okay, not familiar with turn slope. Minimum turn time. Okay, I, I don't even know what system this is. This is yeah. from the, the Bionic software. I haven't done this yet, so I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, reading the cliff notes before I read the book, if you will. So um, what about all these other things here? Do you, do you have anything about that, your, your speed, if you change velocity, faster yeah, or slower? It looks like a slow speed at five miles per hour, you're slowing down your rate that you're transmitting to every 60 seconds. I see. And the fast speed, if you're going over uh, 15 miles per hour, it's got the same uh, number. So you're still transmitting every minute, whether you're going slow or you're going fast. Okay, so if I if I figure out how to um, how to interface with my radio here, my goal should be to set different threshold values so that if I'm going above a certain speed, that means, hey, you're probably off the ground, probably yes. update your, your rate, and then if I go below a certain speed, back it back down to two minutes or that, something that like that. That is correct, yeah. Uh, basically what happens is when you go slower, you don't need to tell somebody where you're at because you're not moving very fast. I mean, you, you think about a turtle. If you had a tracker on a turtle, uh, every minute would be kind of nonsense. It would be uh, using up our bandwidth by transmitting a radio signal out when you really don't need to. And that's and that's an issue? Like yeah. bandwidth is a... Bandwidth can become an issue. You wouldn't want to go out and transmit every five seconds because you'd create a lot of friends. Okay. They're the, also you're being sarcastic, band. right? <laughs> yes, I am. That was sarcasm. <laughs> okay. There's All a right. lot of friends who will contact you to say, hey, uh, you know, you're transmitting every five seconds. And that's not a good thing. Well, I mean... What does the signal look like? Is it a is it a Morse code signal? No, it's a it's a AX.25 uh, packet radio signal. It's just audio tones that go out, and those audio tones are decoded through the radio in a radio modem. 
that turns it into ASCII data that you can see on your screen. So, so, so every signal that I okay, let's say you and I are sitting right here, and let's pretend for just a moment that that we are able to get a signal, and I turn this on, and and I, are you doing it right now? You're actually I, doing. I'm just it. looking to see if I see your uh, your call sign pop up. Okay, let's, so you're you're actually looking at WS4 look KRT at dash two. Look at that. Look at this. Shut Use that camera. List. Look at this. Yeah. All right, so so you actually are seeing. And what go, I'm squawking right now. Yeah, I can actually go down and drill in on that, and it says it's a status message. It's a micro track FA version 1.42. Okay. And if I go so, some more, you don't have any information coming from out your GPS because we're in this metal tuna can. Right. And it can't see the uh, the satellites to get that information. But if it were there and it knew where I was at, it would tell me how far you are from me, and it would give me a little symbol here that shows direction. How would it do that? Like, okay, so... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit using the bandwidth here. I'll turn this off. So people have been mad at me when I've just turned this on to look at the blinky light. They've been mad at me. I didn't realize it. Is that what you're telling me, Tim? Level with me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe. So <laughs> do you need the HDMI cable here so we can pull up stuff on yours? Uh, we can. Uh, actually, yeah, i got a cable plugged in here. To SA oh, it's his cable. Yeah, HDMI will work. Here you go. Maybe they can pull that up. So how long does a data ping last? If I... Every time I send a ping out, like you just saw. We're, we're talking less than 100 milliseconds. So 100 milliseconds, yeah. and, and how big is that string of information? That, that string of information is just going to have some uh, preamble header information on the X.25 signal, and then your payload, and then it's going to have a, uh, uh, a signal at the end of it that gives it a, a checksum that says, okay, is this a good packet or not good packet? So when I receive it, that checksum says, okay, you should have got this number based on the data that you got. If it's not, that's invalid, so it kicks it out. So, so there is no dead reckoning to this. There is no, like, if I don't see a bit of information here, I'm going to try to guess. It just, it's either good or it's, it's not. It's either good or it's bad. Now, you can have it pass all the information, whether it's good or bad, if you choose to, but then you might get garbled information on your screen at that time. Okay. So we're just trying to make sure the data that you get is actually good data. Based on the information and the characters and the bytes that were in there, it gives a check sum that says this is what it should be. If it's not this, then trash it. Okay, so I'm a little confused. You said you said that entire blast of information lasts 100 milliseconds. Yeah, it's, it's not very long. It's so that's that's 10 per second. So if there's every if I was blasting data every five seconds, there's 50 people that could do that on that frequency. Oh yes, absolutely. So why why do people get upset about that? Well, it depends on how many people are out there. If there's a thousand people vying for a little slice of time, then you might have what we call collisions. Okay. And so if two transmitters go off at the same time. Nobody hears that unless somebody's got a stronger signal that gets into one of the digital repeaters or to the Internet gateways to get that information out. So it depends on where they're at and how often it's being transmitted. But, you know, when I look at the HamFest data, if I pulled up the Internet, yesterday we were seeing about 400 packets an hour. In this area, we typically see two to 300 packets on average an hour during a day. But with the HamFest activity, more people coming to town, we see more stations come in, so we actually see that noise level go up. But there's still a lot more bandwidth to go before we, we tap that out. Man, that's – okay, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my brain around this. There's a, there's a lot going on here. So so you are actually looking at everything with your, with your radio there. You were looking at everything. I understand how – you can determine where I am, mm -hmm. but I don't understand how your radio knew the distance between me and you. So it has the ability to triangulate. Yeah. If I have a GPS built into here, yep, you have a GPS in yours. It does it the knows math. The coordinates where I'm at, it knows where the cords you are, and it does the math, and it shows me not only the distance but also the direction you are from my location. So if, wow, so I could I could take this thing. I could clip it onto a balloon. Oh, yeah, we do that here. You do that? Oh, yeah. At the uh, University of Alabama, there's a balloon sat project. They launch balloons up, like, on Saturdays, Saturday mornings. They actually have a, a long-standing permit with the FAA out at the airport that they can launch between certain hours. These things can go up to 100 to 120,000 feet above the Earth. They get up to the edge of space. We put trackers on them because the probability of finding these things when they come back down was very slim. So I got to work with the guys over there. Once we started putting the trackers on the balloon projects, they found every there's a hundred percent return rate. They could find them because they know where it went down. I just I just came up with a video I'm going to do. <laughs> I did. Okay, so no joke. I just came up with a video. There's this thing called the Armstrong limit. Not not Neil Armstrong, a guy named Harry yeah. Armstrong. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm going to do. This is genius. Will you help me? Oh, uh, sure. Okay. You just you don't know what you just volunteered for. So what I want to do is I want to take a marshmallow peep, right? And I'm going to set a marshmallow peep on a on a little plank. You know what I'm talking about here. I'm going to I'm going to 
I'm going to launch this peep with a GoPro up to it. You said you can get 100,000 feet reliably. They, they could go up to, generally they get up to 100,000 feet. Everybody tries to get to that 120. That seems to be a stretch. Between, 100% return rate. Uh, finding the payload, yes. Okay. So the Armstrong line is somewhere in the upper 50,000 feet level, okay? And so you have to wear a space suit or a compressed suit above that line because if you don't, the, the fluids in your lungs will boil off. So what I want to do, now that I know that we are armed with the technology and we can do it, maybe not this one, is I want to put a peep up there. I want to launch it up there to get to a low atmosphere environment and watch it swell up because of the low pressure. Or, and, and put a camera watching it. So you could, put, you could even put a little bit of water in yeah. there, watch the water boil off, couldn't yep. you? Yep, we've actually put cameras on the uh, balloons as they go up. You can actually see the earth get smaller and smaller and further away. And they they try to put cameras to take a look at the balloon to see how it pops when it gets up there because it expands and it gets right. brittle and it just bursts. It's a violent explosion that occurs in space somewhere. We never hear it, but all we hear is the air rushing against the microphone as it's coming back down. Of course, there's no drag on it until it gets about 60,000 feet. And then there's a, a parachute on it as it gets into the Earth's atmosphere and starts to slow it down. When's the last time this happened? When's the last uh, time you guys did this? Typically, uh, you could see these things every Saturday. Uh, Shut morning. up. Oh, this is not happening in my city, and yeah, I didn't know about yeah. this. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. I'm but going to I'm about, gonna kill a peep. You talked about a space suit. They actually drop the space suit. Spa uh, suit from, set. From suit set. Yes, suit set. I know about that. that. Look yes. at that. Geek, geek. Suit set. Tell me about suit set. Suitsat was another experiment that they did with the radio on it. That is a very loud ringtone, Tim. <laughs> Put it in. Yes. I'm sorry. We need to talk about that. Uh, yes. so, Go ahead. That's Go telling ahead. me I've got something coming up here at 1 o'clock. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. But uh, they actually put some equipment inside of a, uh, a space suit and dropped it out to measure some... Uh, parameters that go on inside the suit as it comes out. I don't know all the information about it, but I know, you know, that once they dumped it out, it, the drag started to pull it down until the thing burned up and fell back to Earth. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm going to contact these guys. You have to go at 1 o'clock, right? So yes. let me ask you a couple more APRS questions so I can I can steal your knowledge. If you have to get that, go ahead. I can tap dance no, until you're done. All right, so um, this is the dirty track of my flight the other day, okay? It's pretty nasty. Low resolution. Low resolution. You call it what you want. I'm calling it dirty track. <laughs> so so if you look at each one of these, at these data points, I can go to the data point. Watch, now that I'm on a live stream on the internet, it's not going to work. I'm going to be embarrassed. Look at that. So I can go to that point and I can find out where it entered the internet, That's right? That's right. You can see what station it went to and, and how it got to the internet gateway from there. Okay, so... So let's look at one. Look right there. Yep. That particular point went to your call sign. Yes, went to my call sign. I've got an internet gateway that it took your information and put it on the internet so you can see it on the screen. Okay, so so this went to your call. What physically happened? I, I mean, like when I say physically, I mean the physics of what happened. Okay, so your uh, tracker there uh, took the information from the GPS and packaged it up and put it into a a packet sentence that comes out over the radio modem. So there's a radio modem uh, that puts the information out there over the RF airwaves. I've got a radio receiver at my location there where the gateway is. It received it and it decoded that. And it's okay, I've got your call sign information, I got your uh, latitude, longitude information, I decode that and I put that back out over the internet, over the APRS uh, information highway, the APRS IS is what we call it. And then once it's on the APRS backbone on the Internet, any of these Internet programs that you see, like APRS.fi, will show that station pop up and show it moving in real time. So what's your, what's your favorite Internet uh, tracker? Uh, the Internet tracker, APRS.fi, is a great one because there's a lot more information that you can drill in on to see what all of your uh, sentences look like that came from your transmitter. Every transmission, the timestamp, and all the data that came out. Okay, I have another concern, though. Let's say... And let's, how often do you transmit it? Let's say I did something stupid, right? Not that I would ever do something stupid. That's a joke. I, I do something stupid. I got a ticket today. I did something oh, stupid today. I, we I, talk about yeah, that. we won't talk about that. So let's say I did something stupid, and I, I left my, my radio on, and I went back to Grandma's house, right? Yeah. And I don't, want, I don't want the Internet to know where Grandma's house is because she makes the best apple butter or whatever. Uh -huh. So... D is this data there? It's out there. You can that, never get it back. That data is there, yes. Okay, so that is a risk you run when yes. you operate APRS. Yep. Is you, you, you leave a trail, a little ant breadcrumb trail, wherever you go. Yeah, there is. And there's also other data comes off, like you can have telemetry data. 
There's five channels of telemetry that get put on the packet signal. So one of those channels is an A to D converter. So if you have it hooked up to your battery, it's always monitoring your battery level. If it gets below a certain rate, then you can actually have an alarm triggered at your house to say, hey, your battery got too low. You need to go charge it. Really? Yes. Not that you've ever done this. Or yeah, you can put another switch if somebody opened up the door to your garage, and you can have it transmit that signal out. It sends off an alert back to your radio. Or, or like your chickens didn't come in at night. That's you, right. Or you got your nightly, you know, you got a switch on the chicken coop door, so you're like, you know, Spotsy or Speckles went in for the yeah. night, that no, kind of thing. You, well, you know, the perfect applications would be the river. Is it rising? Is it getting up over top of the bridge? So you can put a, a sensor out there with one of these radios and a transmitter to tell you that the river rose 10 feet overnight and, hey, it's starting to get up over the road and send an alarm out. What would be a good way to, to do that interface? How, how do you connect a physical object to your APRS system so you can import it to the Internet? Where would I go to find that you know that interface, that mechanical interface to the internet. Uh, that that is in some of the programs that you see on the uh, on the web. There's some other programs that we load on our computers that have APRS applications on it. Give They'll me some names. Be specific uh, here. UI View is one of them. Uh, APRS ISCE is another uh, free package that you can download and hook up to your radio. APRS. That's a very popular one right now. ISCE. Okay. Yeah. So what does this do for me? APRS ISCE32 allows you to load that on a Windows-based uh, computer, and from there you can hook to the Internet and see all the data that you've just seen on APRS.fi in a local area. If you hook that up to your radio, you're only going to get local transmissions. If you hook it up to the Internet, you're going to see the whole World Wide Web data downloaded on there. So, well, I, I think I, I might have missed with my question. Okay. I want to know how to physically, just anything, I want to know how to tell if somebody flipped the light switch on at you know a gas station how do i physically connect copper to radio okay how do i make that, that physical connection that, there are some trackers out there that have analog channels on just basically a signal and maybe it's zero to an, five an volts a to signal. d or whatever an a to d yeah so if you got zero to five volts if it's a switch on or off it's either zero off or it's five on or it's vice versa and if you're select you're, you're looking at data based on that voltage level if you calibrate it you can tell what the temperature is vers versus you know, the voltage level. So there are different ways to calibrate it, but there are five channels that we have on the APRS world for some of these trackers that you can actually collect that data, report it, and monitor it remotely. Okay. Do you need to go? Uh, what time is it? Five minutes till one. Five minutes till one. They're probably looking for me over at the APRS forum. Last question before you go. Yes. So we've talked about pushing information to the Internet. Can you also pull with this at all? Uh, from the Internet. So basically it's bi-directional. So if you're connected to the Internet, it's just like you have a radio. So if I don't have a radio and let's say I'm on a, a business trip and I'm in a hotel room, I can pull up my APRS interface on my computer and, get, and play APRS whether I have a radio or not. That's pretty amazing. So it's, All right. it's very well connected, seamlessly. That's pretty fantastic. I, I'm Dustin Sandlin, WS4RKT, Tim Cunningham, Cunningham, Intelligent Ham, Ham Operator. That's nice. Very nice. And your call is? N-A-D-E-U. Fantastic. So if you want to ask questions, I, I live near Tim, so I'm. this is a connection that's going to last. Tweet me at Smarter Every Day. You can also tweet Gigaparts at, at Gigaparts. You can find out more information there, and we can get you what you need. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, stay tuned. I'm sure there's more stuff coming on after us. Have a good one.